The Quranic verses that imply some idea that there is a relationship between the human spirits and the divine spirits are especially important to the Sufis when they are talking about the human spirit. Whatever the connection between God's spirit and God is, as we've discussed in another video, the human spirit is definitely derived from that spirit. Three verses in the Quran discuss God's spirit in relation to human creation. Nonetheless, the term divine spirit, as used here, is literally never mentioned in the Quran. It refers to the spirit in a number of Quranic verses, and most Quranic commentators believe that this is the same as the greatest of the angels by basing it upon this Quranic verse, that they, the spirits and the angels, stand in rows non speaking save one whom the compassionate permits and who speaks right. The following Quranic verse is quoted to support the idea that humans find it difficult to comprehend the reality of the spirit. They ask thee about the spirit. Say, the spirit is from the command of my Lord, and you have not been given knowledge, save a little. Although many scholars interpret this verse to imply that the spirit cannot be understood, they don't mean to imply that no understanding of it can be attained. In contrast to, for instance, the body which can be known, defined, evaluated, analyzed, and so on, the spirit, it is said, cannot be defined because it is inherently what it is. When it comes to the attributes of the spirit, however, both human experience and the Islamic sources actually offer a significant amount of discursive knowledge, even if discursive knowledge of the spirit itself is still unreachable. The relationships that are established between the spirit and the body are then defined by these attributes. For instance, the relationship is obvious because the spirit is said to govern the body. When the inherent attributes of spirit, such as living, are stated, the relation to the body can be understood because the body per se is literally dead. It can only remain viable because and only because there is the spirit inside the body. As we have cited earlier, the Quran tells, say the spirit is from the command of my Lord. It is permitted to say no more than that the spirit is a divine business and it pertains to the word of the command. Regarding the word of the command, the Quran says, He created the sun, the moon, and the stars, all subjected by his command. The creation and the command belong to him alone. As we have seen, the word command is used in this sense in contrast to the word creation which refers to the word of creation or the word of the parties. The word of the command is therefore the word of spirits. The Quran uses the phrase the spirits from his command several times and in this case, command appears to be used in a different context. Ibn Arabi makes a distinction between the ascribed divine spirit and the command spirit on the basis of this context. The first type of spirit is ascribed to the pronoun my, our, and his in several Quranic verses, whereas the second type of spirit carries commands that God directs at particular creatures. To the latter, God sends messages to the prophets and the folk of God in order to give confirmation to them, while to the former, it is what God blows into all parties. God gives guidance to man through the spirit from the command. Ibn Arabi, by quoting the Qur'an, says, And God guides whomsoever he will unto a straight path, through the revealed spirit of God's command. So, that is the guidance of God, with which he guides whomsoever he will amongst his servants. God thus confirms such a guidance through that spirit of command. An addition, Ibn Arabi calls knowledge the spirit, because knowledge makes the heart alive, just as spirits make all the parties alive. Quote, since hearts come alive through knowledge, just as the entities of all bodies come alive through spirits, God named knowledge a spirit that the angels bring down upon the hearts of God's servants, and that he also casts and reveals without any intermediary in the case of his servants. His casting and revealing it is his words, even so we have revealed to thee a spirit from our command, 
As for sending down the angels with it upon the hearts of his servants, that is his words, he sends down the angels with the spirit from his command upon whomever he will of his servants. Hence these angels in the absent to men are teachers and mentors that are witnessed by those upon whom they descend. With regard to the two verses quoted by Ibn Arabi above, he further explains that the spirit in the first verse is the trustworthy spirit which was sent down to the Prophet Muhammad, namely the Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, what is meant by the Spirit in the second verse is a warning, namely a warning that there is no God but I so reverence me. The Spirit here is a warning brought by the angels so that any of the servants of God who receive it come alive, as the bodies live due to the particular spirits. Quote, he says, he casts the Spirit from his command upon whomever he will of his servants. He sends down the angels with the Spirit from his command upon whomever he will of his servants. Warn that there is no God but I. He did not say he. Hence the Spirit is what is cast from God to the hearts of his servants, and God's command does the casting. The Spirit indicated in this verse is the form of his words, there is no God but I. So reverence me. Ibn Arabi also explains that in this state, the intermediary disappears because the sent-down revelation is identical to the Spirit, whilst the sender of the revelation is God, nothing else. So the Spirit is not identical with the angel, but it is identical with the message, Ibn Arabi maintains. In this way station, the intermediary is lifted, for the sent-down revelation is identical with the Spirit, where the one who casts is God, none other. Hence, the spirit is not the same as the angel, but it is the same as the message. So understand, a spirit like this is not known by the angels, for it is not of their kind. It is a spirit that is not carried, nor is it luminous, while the angel is a spirit in light. This testing belongs to us and to all the prophets. As for angels, they may be those whom God has specified for the messengers. This is his words, the trustworthy spirit has brought it down upon thy heart. So he is the messenger to the messenger. The spirit from the command in the two Quranic verses which have been mentioned in Ibn Arabi's elucidation show several different meanings. On one occasion, he says that the Spirit is the trustworthy Spirit or the Holy Spirit. On another occasion, he says that the Spirit is a warning, namely a warning that there is no God but Allah and a stipulation for people to reverence Him. On another occasion, he says that the revealed message is identical with the Spirit. And on another occasion, he also says that the Spirit is the one who transmits knowledge of the unseen to the hearts of God's servant. The impression to our understanding is that Ibn Arabi does not consistently give the exact meaning of the spirit from the command. There is a seemingly personal spirit, namely the trustworthy spirit or the Holy Spirit, and the one that transmits knowledge of the unseen to the hearts of God's servants. But there is also spirit that seems impersonal, namely warning and revealed message. Perhaps Ibn Arabi would like to emphasize its essential meaning. That is, its function to revive the hearts of God's servants, both the messenger and the message itself, both the transmitter of knowledge and the knowledge itself, both the bearer of revelation and the revelation itself. Additionally, taking the essential meaning, we can try to connect it to the particular spirits that make our bodies come alive. In this particular context, Ibn Arabi also explained further how the particular spirits govern our bodily lives. Ibn Arabi describes the human body and everything in it as a kingdom. God establishes a state or a kingdom to be residence of the vice with his people and government officials. What is meant by the vice here is as it is said in the Quranic verse, I am placing a vice upon the earth. God has made human beings as his vice on earth because of their qualities and privileges compared to other creatures. A human is God's vicegerent who is in charge of leading the world as his kingdom. As a matter of fact, his true kingdom is a kingdom in himself. The real earth is the earth of his own body together with parts and inhabitants that can be managed by the government guided by God. The most important thing to note is that humans can only become God's vicegerent on the earth when they have been able to become the vicegerent 
on the earth in themselves. According to Ibn Arabi, having constructed the kingdom, God appoints a special place for the vicegerent. That special place is the heart. God says in Hadith Qudsi, Neither my earth nor my heavens could contain me, whilst the heart of my believing servant does contain me. The Prophet says, Indeed, God doesn't look at your bodies nor at your forms, rather he looks at your heart. And he also says, Verily, in the body is a piece of flesh which, if sound, the entire body is sound, and if corrupt, the entire body is corrupt. Truly, it is the heart. Ibn Arabi distinguishes a physical heart from a spiritual heart called Qalb, which in the Quran it is said, Truly, it is not the eyes that go blind, but it is hearts within breasts that go blind. If the leader is good, the people are good too. If it is corrupted, the people are also. The leader is a spirit dwelling in the spiritual heart. God also establishes a garden in the highest part of the kingdom called brain as the residence of the prime minister called the mind or akal. He opens four large windows to watch over the kingdom. The four windows are ears, eyes, nose, and mouth. He also builds in front of the garden a storage area called the storehouse of imagination. God also makes the nafs a place of change and cleansing. The spirit marries the nafs and this marriage gives birth to the body. In addition, God also creates a tribal chief called the caprice and the minister called the appetite. The nafs is often tempted and seduced by the caprice and the appetite so that it falls into the arms of the soul commanding to evil. The mind does not prevent it, even deceive the vicegerent so that the vicegerent doesn't know that his wife has been taken. When the nafs realizes that she has been deceived, she begins to regret her action. She is then aware and inspired to do good deeds. That situation makes her calm because she has united with her husband with the help of God. Ibn Arabi advises us to make friends with good people, but evil friends are not far from ourselves. They are within ourselves. It is said, fight your caprice, for it is your greatest enemy. God says, O you who believe, fight those disbelievers who are near to you. The disbelievers are those who are closest to you. That is to say, they are within ourselves. This is in line with what the Prophet said after the battle of Badr. We have returned from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. The companions asked, What is the greater jihad? The Prophet replied, The struggle against oneself. In short, since God makes the spirits the vicegerent of the body, the existence of our spirit is the expression of our striving to govern our own body, our thoughts, our feelings, our senses, our hearts, our ego, so that we turn full into the bankruptcy of our own kingdom. I'll see you next time.